All right, chapter 15, contributed capital. So what this one is, is by now you know equity is in the accounting equation, the total asset the company owns in order for them to do their business, less liabilities, what they owe to outside parties. All right? The stockholder's equity has two, primarily two separate categories in a classified balance sheet. They have the contributed capital, how much of this equity has been given to the corporation by its owners, by the shareholders. And then they have earned capital, and that is how much has the board of directors decided to leave in the business of total earnings. And earnings is not just made up of net income from the income statement, but it is also made up of that other comprehensive income category that we saw when we were talking about investments. Remember the unrealized gains and losses on available for sale securities? Doesn't go to the income statement like trading securities do and, and add to or subtract from net income. It only goes to the stockholders' equity section. So it's in this earned capital area. Um, the other thing that you'll find in here is translations on uh, foreign exchange, the not transactions, but actual translations of subsidiaries goes into there. So, all right, so retained earnings uh, is the prior balance of retained earnings plus net income minus any dividends that are returned to the shareholders. So any capital that has been returned to shareholders in the form of dividends. So as it earns income, the equity goes up. As it pays dividend, it declares and pays dividends, it goes down. And then any transaction between the owners and the company affects stockholders' equity. If owners buy more capital stock, you issue a new class of stock to new owners, or you buy back some stock, any kind of stock transactions between the owners and the company affects this uh, category here. All right, so there's just a graph of it. Primarily, it's net income, revenues minus expenses, plus gains and losses. And then any type of dividends is the common effects of a, of a simple capital style corporation. You know, somebody started a corporation by investing some seed money and then there hasn't been any change for years and years and years other than to retained earnings. Okay, that's overwhelmingly the majority of corporate transactions. But you do need to know, and we'll talk primarily about this little square here, and that's share-based compensation, all right? Because that does affect the stockholders' equity section. Many companies, whether they're privately held or publicly traded, have share-based compensation. Many large corporations, publicly traded, Walmart and the likes, have shares available for purchase to employees, all right? And I'll caution you like I cautioned yesterday's class. You may get one of those offers someday, and you think, yes, I know this company. It's, I believe in my employer. I'm going to buy some stock. Sometimes they will offer you very low interest loans in order to make those purchases. I've got a friend of mine that I used to work with, and he was working for a real estate investment trust up in Denver. At the time, they were the largest holder of real estate in the United States. They owned multifamily apartment complexes, they owned retail, both large malls and strip centers, and they owned uh, warehouse space. They owned more of it than any other company. So they were really strong. So Fanetto, was his last name, jumped whole hog 
And he borrowed as much money as he could to buy that stock that they offered. And then the stock went down. And the problem with that is, is as the stock continued to go down, it was no longer a great place to work. But he couldn't quit. It was a essentially indentured servitude from that point on. And we all thought this, you'd have to know Fanetto. You'd have to know him. He was, it was funny to the rest of us because he couldn't leave because to leave he would have to pay off his loan first. And the stock wasn't val worth enough to sell to pay off his loan. So, caution. And that's the same issue that happened with many, many employees of Enron. Is, is that they were taking their retirement 401k contributions and investing them in Enron stock and uh, at the company's encouragement. And so when that whole house of cards collapsed, it, everybody lost everything. So just caution about the buying shares in your employer. Because <laughs> maybe they're not telling you everything. Okay, so shareholders, the owners of the corporation, Owners of corporations, well, I'll get to that here in a second. Corporations do have higher tax rates in essence because they are subject to double taxation. What does that mean? How are corporations doubly taxed on earnings from the shareholder point of view? Nobody knows. You've never heard this controversy. We talk about it all the time in the news because it is a dis Correct. Dividends from corporations are taxable to the shareholders, to the individuals. And so they have to pay their individual marginal tax rate on any dividends received, but the corporations have already paid taxes on the net corporate earnings. And so there is a, there is a double taxation there that has been talked about for decades about how unfair it is, but we got to remember that taxation is primarily tax policy is to get politicians reelected, not to raise money to finance a centralized government. That's a quote from Milton Friedman, who was one of my favorite economists. Yes, sir. Is there a tax bracket for corporations? What's that? Is there a graduated tax for corporation? Yes. Yeah, there is tax brackets. I don't remember what it is. I think it starts at 15 and goes up to 33. 35, maybe? 35, yeah. Yeah. So, but I know nothing about taxes. I'm not here. I can barely do my own. So don't ask me those questions. <laughs> All right. All right. Privately held corporations are owned by the government. Now, I'm not talking about closely held corporation. That's different. Closely held corporations are non-publicly traded. All right, which is technically referred to as an open corporation. Stocks are bought and sold on an open exchange. Closed corporations don't allow, these are privately held. So, and then we have domestic, oops, not domestic, public corporations. So this is uh, public radio, uh, public TV, the post office, Amtrak, these are all owned by the government. Okay? So you either have a publicly traded or a privately closely held corporation. So, and there are some very large ones. The most famous of one here recently within the last year is Dell is now a closed corporation. All right? Because they took that private. It's no longer, no longer publicly traded on the, new, on the uh, NASDAQ, okay? So Michael Dell and a bunch of investment bankers took that off of the market for reasons that are still a mystery, but <laughs> solves a lot of problems. All right, domestic corporations are only domestic in the state in which they were incorporated. So you know by now that their corporations are Thus, based upon individual states. 
So in order to incorporate, you take a charter up to the Secretary of State in the state in which you want to file and have a grant for this corporation, and then that allows you to establish that business in that form. Okay? So Starbucks is only a domestic corporation in the state of Washington. Walmart is only a domestic corporation in the state of Arkansas. So back to my favorite example of Dell, where's, what's Dell a domestic corporation of? That's what you would believe, wouldn't it? It's Delaware. They incorporated it in Delaware. Delaware has very favorable tax laws at the state level. And so very, very often you will see uh, corporations incorporated in Delaware. Probably the majority of U.S. corporations are incorporated there. Anytime they operate outside of that state, they're a foreign corporation. So Dell files a tax return, as does Starbucks and Walmart. They file returns. They don't call them tax returns. It's because we're not allowed to tax income in the state of Texas. It's against our Constitution. But they have something very similar. You know, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a tax. It's very similar that you have to file. And, but it's not income tax here in the state of Texas. But you have a different form for foreign corporations. So Dell and Starbucks and Walmart all have to file that other form because they're a foreign corporation as far as the state of Texas is concerned. So it's a legal entity. You take your charter or your articles of incorporation up there. They're not complicated. You could do it yourself in an afternoon. You walk up there. You pay your fee. You make sure that the name hasn't been taken. You file it. You walk away. Go have lunch somewhere near the state capitol. Come back in the afternoon, and they hand you your, art your certificate. It's done. It's very simple to do. You don't need a bunch of attorneys involved. So what can a corporation do? Everything. You can take two corporations and put them together so they can sort of get married. You can take two corporation, one corporation and split them out. They can get a divorce. They can be born. They can die. They can own property. They can sell property. They can be sued. They can file suits. They can do everything that you as citizens in the United States can do with one notable exception. What are they not allowed to do that you get the right vote. to vote? They're not allowed to vote. They have different ways of doing that. That was the comment from yesterday. Have you all heard of the Koch brothers? I think yeah. Koch brothers? $800 yes. $800 million. Almost a billion dollars towards influencing an election. You know what my attitude is on that? I very ra rarely politicize in class, but this one's an interesting dilemma to me. That's, there's only 300 million people in the United States. Every man, woman, and child. They can just write me a check for $3 million, and I'll vote the way they want me to. I can be bought. <laughs> it just seems silly, doesn't it? You could end poverty in this country with that same amount of money. You could give every man, woman, and child in America three million dollars. Just, I, I, I'm struggling. Ever since I heard that news, I'm just struggling with it. Anyway, just. So if anybody knows them, tell them, give me a call. I can be bought for one election cycle. All right, so this is, they can continue indefinitely. So what, did, um, so what is your rights as a shareholder? If you own a share of common stock, just one share, what do you get the privilege of doing? Guaranteed under the laws of the United States. You do get to vote. You get to vote for the board of directors in an annual meeting. Now, not all the board of directors are up because they normally stagger the terms, but whoever's, what's that? I thought you had to have like, like a certain amount of 
Nope. Nope. To influence it, to make it count, but you get the right to vote. Yep. I get proxy statements, and I don't own much of Boeing stock, but I do get proxy statements asking for me to, you know, swing my little blocks behind the uh, whatever it is they're trying to do, which I never sign. But I can show up at their annual meeting, say, here I am. Here's my paltry little one one thousandths of a percent ownership, <laughs> if I have that much. So you get the right. And then what does the board of directors do? They then elect and hire executives. Not elect, but hire the executives. So the management is, is approved by the board of directors. The board of directors is elected by the shareholders. So we do influence that. Okay. This is what a stock certificate looks like. You can go out and buy one, and it'll have your nice little name on it. You won't be able to buy this one anymore because it's no longer public. <laughs> but back in the day, you could. Um, it, and here it does say it's incorporated in the laws of the state of Delaware. They're, it's transferable, so their registrar is located in New York, New York. It has a par value of one cent which is key because most states requires that there be a par value attached to the common shares. Many states, not all of them, but many states also have a law that you're not allowed to sell a share of stock for less than its stated par value, which is why many of them have a very, very de minimis par value. A penny in this case with Dell, oftentimes you'll see a dollar, something like that. So because there are, law, there are states, not all of them, not all 50, but there are states in the United States that uh, have within their corporate laws that you're not allowed to sell a share of stock for less than its par value. So here's Bell & Howe, incorporated in Illinois. So each one has a right to the dividend. So if common shareholder dividends are declared, you get the earnings to that, uh, assuming you still own it on the date of record. And we'll talk about this. Dividends have three important dates. The date of declaration, which is the date that the board of directors that you had a hand in electing, declares a dividend. There is a date of record, because records are now kept electronically. So if you're the registered shareholder of that particular share of stock, you will get whatever pennies that they declared per share. Sometimes it's more than pennies. I mean, Microsoft had a one that was, my recollection was it was $10, $15 a share. It was the largest dividend ever declared. All right? And then there'll be a date of payment when they actually mail out the checks. But how that affects the price, because they're in the price that is listed either in the Wall Street Journal or on Yahoo Finance or MSN Money, anything like that, you'll see that when the board of directors declares the dividends, whatever the dividend is for on a per share basis, it bumps up in that day. And then it's with dividends. They've got some Latin term that I've forgotten. But it's with dividends until the date of record. And then when it becomes the date of record, then it's X something, some another Latin word. It's after dividend. And then the stock price goes down exactly by that same amount. So you can sit there and track the stock price. It bumps up. Stays there for a little while between the declaration date and the date of record, and then the, once the date of record is hit, it comes back down. So in other words, if you own the stock on the day that it's declared and then sell it before the dividend uh, date of record, you still, in essence, get the, the, stock, the dividend. Because just like when we were selling bonds in between uh, cash interest payments, the interest payable is built into the price, right? So the stock worked the same way with dividends. You get the right to elect the directors, 
And then you get a preemptive right. You get a right if they issue more common stock. You have first rights to those new shares before outside investors can buy. So in other words, you have the right to maintain your ownership in that corporation for common shareholders, not the same, not the same with uh, preferred shareholders. Okay. Many corporations have a complex capital structure, so they'll have more than one class of stock. Uh, a lot of times, family-owned businesses will have this. They'll start with a Class B common stock that, uh, that they'll start passing on to the heirs in a generation-skipping type uh, trust, and then you know, they'll eventually inherit the ownership uh, when, the, uh, when their parents or grandparents uh, pass away type thing. Um, preferred stock, there are many classes of preferred stock and there are many terms of that are associated with preferred stocks. Some preferred stocks are guaranteed a dividend. It's, they're called cumulative preferred. I think I have a slide on that. No, I'll talk about that here in a second. They're called cumulative. In other words, if there isn't any money to distribute dividends in, a, in one year and you own a cumulative preferred stock, then the next year when they do have the ability to declare a dividend, you will get not only this year's dividends but the last year's that's in arrears. And so that's desirable and will be properly reflected in the, in the overall price. There are three numbers that you always will see on the balance sheet, and it's often commonly put in the classified area um, of the stock equity, associated with stock issuance. There is the total stock authorized. This is in the corporate charter. How much stock of Class A common can ever be issued? There's how many have actually been issued. So you might commonly see there's a million shares authorized, but only half a million has been issued because that's all they've sold so far. And then how many are still outstanding? And the, the majority of times, all two of those three numbers, the issued and outstanding, are the same, but often they're not. And the reason they're often not is because of treasury stock. So what's treasury stock? What's that? It's stock owned by the corporation that issues it. It's the snake eating its tail. If Dell, Dell's a bad example, if Boeing wants to go out and buy Boeing shares, they can. They're just like you are, except they can't vote for president. They can't be influenced by the Koch brothers by sending them $3 million. They can buy their own stock, and they frequently do. Why would a corporation buy its own stock? It does drive up the price because what's happened? There's less ownership of the remaining investors out there. So for a simple example, let's say there's 10 investors each owning 100 shares for 1,000 shares. The corporation turns around and buys a hundred of those shares from one of the investors into treasury stock. So you used to own 10% of it before that transaction. How much do you own after it? 11 and change is what the math is because you now own a hundred of 900 shares because that hundred shares isn't actively circulating out in the market anymore. So they buy it to stave off primarily a decline in stock prices because as you buy treasury stock, the price will go up because the pro rata ownership of the remaining shareholders has increased. A much more common reason to do that, because that's temporary, the market eventually sees through those kind of shenanigans and the price tends to slide back down. Um, a more common reason is when we get to these share compensation for stock options 
or employee purchase plans, you need shares of stock to give to the employees that have bought them, right? Well, going out and issuing new stock dilutes the other shareholders, plus they have the preemptive rights to buy those. So you need to go out on the open market and buy up some shares in order to be able to give it to the employees. Right? So that's the most more common reason that you'll see treasury stock. All right. So we talked about the par value. Anything that is paid for the shares of stock to the corporation, not the changes in values in the open market where shareholders are selling amongst themselves, but when corporations sell, anything paid over the par value goes into a separate stockholders capital account paid in capital in excess of par. All right. So if we issue 500 shares of $5 par common stock for $16 a share, then the debit is $8,000 to cash. The credit to common stock at a $5 par value is $2,500, and the remaining $5,500 goes into this additional paid in capital. All right, don't worry about stated values. Not worried about bundled or combined. Let's go through that. All right, stock issue cost. In order for you to do an initial public offering or a new public offering, there's all sorts of fees, legal fees, stock certificate, underwriter fees. Back a long time ago, you used to be able to capitalize these as startup or organizational costs and then amortize them over a 20-year period or 25-year period. Now you're not. It's expensed. It's like any other startup cost. The issuance of stock is expensed as incurred. So that's something that has changed in the last 40 years, which is the only reason we bring it up. All right. Stock subscription. So the main thing I want to talk about and what I will test you on is this well, I'll talk about stock splits when we do the problems on Thursday. So, A reverse stock split is worth mentioning. What's a reverse stock split other than what it says on the board? And what would be a really good way of using it? You know what a stock split is, right? Two-for-one stock split is if you own 10 shares, when they declare that, now you own 20 shares. And the reason they do that is, is that there's a perceived sweet spot of between $50 and $250 for the price of a single share of stock. So when it starts climbing up and getting way above the $250 into the $500 range, they commonly split the stock to bring the stock price down to this perceived sweet spot. All right, That's the reason they do stock splits. But what can you do with a reverse? In a reverse stock split, it's the opposite. So if the shares were trading down in $5 range, you could reverse them. You had 20 shares, now you got 10. You do a one for two reverse stock split, and now the price goes back up. So you could play those kind of games. But I'll tell you a really good one that I hopefully you'll remember. If you ever become the majority shareholder of a closely held corporation, you can use this to get rid of everyone else. So how would you do that? Let's go back to our simple example. There's a thousand shares outstanding. You own 501 shares. You do a 500 to 1 reverse stock split. And you put in the board of directors that you control, because you have 501 shares, you put in the board of directors motion that any partial share, if you don't have enough shares, means you don't have at least 500 so that you can get one share, complete share of stock, then you're paid out for your partial shares. And boom, the next day, you're not granted, you've got to pay them the value of their shares. But now you're the sole shareholder of that corporation. You own 100% of it, and you don't have to deal with all the rest of them. That was done here in San Antonio in a very, very famous but 
not well publicized case involving the San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right? Okay. Let's go. I'm not going to talk about warrants. We'll be talking next chapter about warrants and uh, a, a lot when we get into earnings per share calculation. So I'll leave that for there. Come on. All right. Non-compensatory and compensatory share purchase plans. The non-compensatory is the Walmart. If you go to work for Walmart as a stock clerk or a cashier, they'll allow you to buy Walmart stock. All right? It's not compensation to you. You're buying it at its current market value. They may have a loan program, and I've already cautioned you about that. Don't borrow money to buy stock. That's a bad thing. Um, and so it just, that's a share purchase plan. What we really want to focus on and what the vast majority of the problems that I'll do on Thursday is compensation plans. Here, either all the employees or more commonly the senior employees are offered a stock option plan to buy a share of stock at a strike price, at a particular price per share, sometime in the future if they stay with the company. Because there's almost always there's a vesting period associated with these compensation plans. So for instance, if you're a senior executive and I'm the owner of this corporation and I want to make sure you keep working for me, I will give you the rights to buy shares so that you too could become an owner at a future date if you stay working for me for three years. So at the end of the three years, you get the right to exercise these options. All right? Does everybody understand how this works? This is a very, very common way of compensating individuals with startups. Real common. Because startups aren't very cash rich. So when, you know, Google and... Facebook and all the rest of them first started opening up, they needed talent at the executive level, but they couldn't afford to pay them in cash like, you know, the established corporations can. So they give them these compensated plans and say, okay, you come to work for me and you stay for three or five years, then you get this block of stock that stock options that you can then buy in. And if, not if, but when, because everybody that has ever been involved with a startup believes that it will eventually go public. We are all convinced of that. I've been involved in a number of them, not a one of which ever became public, which is why I work today. And I'm waiting for the Koch brothers, the Koch brothers to call me. Give me my three million. Okay? But that's a very common ploy. I've got lots and lots of worthless stock options over my career. So how do we account for it is the big question. So there's a grant date, the date that the board of directors decided to initiate this plan. There is a value to those options on the grant date. All right? And there, there's a calculation as to what's the market price currently on this date What's the strike price, the exercise price? So if the tr stock is trading at $18 a share, but the stock price, uh, the option price, is $10 a share, then there's an $8 compensation to the employee at the grant date that's depending upon vesting. All right? So you recognize the periodic cost, and then you report this compensation expense and this increase in stockholders' equity. So let's just get to an example, and that will make sense here. This is the information we'll need. All right. Where is it? Okay. We adopt a compensatory share option plan granting 9,000 shares of options 
that will allow you to buy one share each of common stock. You have to exercise it over the next 10 years, and 30 employees in our corporation are granted these options. Well, on the date that this was adopted, on January 1, 2013, $50 is the exercise price, and it was equal to the market price of the stock as of that date. So there was no differential. The exercise price is equal to the current market value, so there's no taxable compensation to these executives on the date that they receive these options. All right? Because that's important many times. The options will vest at the end of the three years if the, exec the 30 selected employees are still employed by the company. They expect 10% of those, or three employees, to quit over that three-year period. So that's the baseline assumption when the grant date was issued. So what we need to do is we'll take the fair value of the option, the $18, Multiply it by the 9,000 options times uh, the 9% for the forfeiture. So here's the plan. We estimate the total compensation cost to be $145,000. That's the $18 fair value times the 9,000 options times the expected retention of 90%. One, at the end of 2013, one-third of the vesting period has now expired. So that gives us a compensation expense of $48,600. So it's a debit, and I'll show you the, the uh, debit and credit here. It's a debit to compensation expense and a credit to uh, share-based compensation. And it, that's a stockholder's equity. So we're debiting an expense and crediting a stockholder's equity account. Then the next year, we have the same, there's no, no expectations of changes. Because the next year, what could happen is, is that rather than that 90% being retained, maybe by the end of year two, when you're two out of the three years, you might have more better information. You know, maybe three executives are already left and we're expecting at least one or two more, in which case that number could and would commonly change. Right? And then at the end of it, the end of the three years, who's left standing? And each time you're calculating it now, two-thirds of the vesting period has gone by. Total compensation is worth $97,200. we have already taken and recognized 48600 so that leaves us 48600 And then at the end, we know how many executives out of the original 30 are still with the company. And so only 7,500 options actually vest, and they get, um, you subtract the 97 that you've already taken, and that gives you 37. So the entries are, oops, where's the entry? Okay, this is performance based. I thought there was entries in here. Apparently not. I looked at it yesterday. Let me see. No. I love it when slides disappear. All right, we'll talk about the entries on Thursday. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, fixed compensation. So you granted them at the outset of the three years. At the end of the three years, they got to exercise them. All right? There is also performance-based, and this is, more, this is also very, very common, is, is that we'll give you the rights to so many shares of stock. If the company's sales, if the company's net income, if the company's gross margin, if the market price of the stock, increases by a factor. So if sales go up 10%, you'll get these stock options. If it doesn't go up 10%, you get nothing. What happens if it goes up 
or 20%? Well, you'll get more. Okay? So they'll oftentimes, in a performance-based stock option plan, they'll oftentimes put in these thresholds. And the higher the performance, whatever the, the factor is, whether it's sales, gross margin, net income, earnings per share, whatever it is that it's, the plan is designed around, if they meet a minimum threshold, they get so much. If they meet an intermediate threshold, they get more. And if they meet an almost unattainable threshold, they'll get even more. All right? So in this case, and for simplicity, an example here, because this is all we're going to do, and then we'll call it a day, um, is that same three-year vesting period, it's got a $50 excise price. Current value of that option is $18. They uh, will each get a minimum of 300 shares. However, let's see here. If the market share, if the market price is increased by 5%, they'll get 100 shares. If it goes up 10%, they'll get 200 shares. And if it goes up 20%, they'll get all 300 shares that the plan allots, okay? So, at the end of the 2015, it has, in fact, increased by more than 20%. But of the 30 employees, only 25 are left standing. So, at the end of the first year, we expected 200 options. That was, we expected it only to go up 15% in price. So it was only going to get that intermediate reward when we first designed the plan. That was an estimate we made. We also expected that we were only going to lose 8% of the 30 um, employees. So you take the 200 options times the 30 employees times the retention rate times the fair value, we get a total expected compensation of $99,360. One third of that is 33, ah, here's my option, here's my entries. I told you I knew they were on there somewhere. Debit to compensation expense and a credit to paid in capital from share options. All right, and this is whether it was a performance base or just a plain uh, compensatory plan. Then at the end of the second year, we, re we revised the retention rate. We initially expected to only lose 8% of the 30 executives. Now we think we're going to lose 12% of them. All right? So same calculation. We also don't expect the share price to go up any more than the 15%. So 200 options, 30 employees times an 88% retention rate times. Now we expect $95,040. So two factors happen. One the retention rate was adjusted, okay? So one thir two thirds of that now, subtract out what we've already taken, and now we're gonna debit compensation expense 30,240 and credit the same paid in capital from share options. Then at the end of the plan, in fact, the price went up to where they each get all 300 shares. But we only have 25 out of the 30. So in reality, because 12% would have been, what, three employees, and in reality we lost five. So even the 12% was too conservative. So now we have 25 employees times the 300 shares because the price has in fact gone up 20%, and so they get their full... Uh, plan maximum, and that's 135,000. Subtract out the 63,360 that we've already taken, and in the last year you have 71,640 dollars. And then the l next step is is okay. What do you do when somebody actually buys this stock? And we'll do those entries because um, it's not in the slide. Pack. It's not in the powerpoints. We'll do those entries on Thursday. All right. Crystal clear, right? It's just another chapter that we have to go over. <laughs> this is all CPA exam prep. Because the chances of you having to account for this any time in your career, very, very minimal. 
All right. Any questions? All right.